The crumbling ruins of the Empire left a vacant throne, nothing more than the empty husk of Imperium. When Gog and Magog stormed the gates, a reign of chaos ensued. They squabbled amongst themselves for the right to sit on the empty throne, imagining that if they only donned the regalia of the kingly office, that they could enjoy a power they did not understand. As the tarnished crown was passed back and forth among unfit men through the ages, the gold from which it was originally cast became obscured by a thick layer of grime. When the last shimmer of its original beauty was gone, it was tossed aside as a worthless relic of a backward age. Having established Evola's arguments for the supremacy of the Sacred King as being above and beyond caste, we now turn our attention to the concept of governance and rulership, and the degeneration that it undergoes when it loses its spiritual foundation. Evola introduces us in this chapter to ideas that he will develop further in the latter half of the book, where he traces the origins of the decline of the modern world. In the world of tradition, royal power was believed to have a supernatural origin. The concept of the divine right of kings stems from this belief that a king was the embodiment of divine cosmic law on earth. This supernatural power went beyond simply being a representative of the people he governed. Unlike modern political leaders who derive their right to rule from popular appeal to the masses, from the plebeian strata of society, Traditional kings exercised a divine right to rule, a right that came from above them rather than below them, a right from God rather than from man. Whether the king was born as a god, descended from a god, initiated into a god's mysteries, or consecrated to a god, he was imbued with a transcendent power that connected him imminently to the law from above, allowing him to manifest it on earth through his rule. We must not confuse the traditionalist conception of empire with the various nations and peoples it encompasses. The empire is something separate, superior, and existing prior to any of the parts that exist within it. The sacred emperor claimed for himself an absolute right due to his embodiment of the supernatural forces conferred onto him through initiation or consecration, and because of this he was owed a certain fides a spiritual bond of faithfulness and devotion. It is this sacred fidelity which bound a feudal serf to his lord, the lord to his prince, and so on. In a degenerated version of the empire, the bonds that tie the hierarchy together are of an economic, political, or military nature. The bonds are material rather than spiritual, and thus lack any true gravitas. There is no true center that can draw all around it into a harmonious orbit, but rather a mishmash of competing interests. The true center represented by the sacred king who sits at the heart of the traditional empire provides a point of unity that transcends material existence and brings the diversity of material concerns into alignment with something higher. This chain of fidelity linked all parts of traditional civilization to the center represented by the empire. The traditional empire had no need of material force, no need to take up arms to conquer in order to bring all its constituent parts into line. 
The transcendent power and authority present within the center creates such a well of spiritual gravity that all feel compelled to acknowledge it. Evola says that generally speaking within civilizations descended from a Hyperborean lineage, there was often a high degree of pluralism. Families and tribes made up many small-scale city-states or entities of political power, and they typically enjoyed a high degree of autonomy. The aristocratic family possessed everything they needed for their material and spiritual lives. They had their own lands and militias, their own laws, and their own family cults for the worship and preservation of their family's tutelary gods. On a larger scale, an entire stock of people or tribe possessed the same. What need did they have for an empire to give them these things? No need at all, in fact, and so their participation in the empire was voluntary. Based on the recognition that the empire constituted a unifying principle, in fact, these families and tribes possess the ingredients necessary for the superior organization that is capable of developing into an empire. It is only from those with a spiritual nobility and virility that an empire can arise from. These ingredients are tradition, a common origin, and a common race, not just of the body, but also a common race of spirit. The presence of these ingredients is especially likely to develop into an empire if and when the original stock begins to spread out over a large geographical region. Evola gives the example of the early Franks and says that to be a Frank was considered synonymous with being free, as well as superior to other people by virtue of the dignity of their race. By free we mean masters of themselves, not enslaved by their passions and animalistic tendencies. And it is this freedom that elevated the dignity of their race, giving them a superiority not in a mere biological and material sense, but spiritually and ontologically. This is not dissimilar to the concept we have previously spoken of in regards to a race of men without kings, who possessed a glory that made them kings unto themselves. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire emerged a new Frankish Empire. Initially, up until the 9th century, the common race and civilization of the Franks formed the foundation of the state, though there was no real centralized or organized political unity. With the rise of the Carolingian dynasty, an empire was established, with Charlemagne being crowned as the first Holy Roman Emperor in 800 AD. By this time, Frankish nobility was widely scattered, but Evola says that despite being separate and autonomous, they still maintained a connection to the center, that is, the vital force of their race on a spiritual level which tied them all together, which Evola likens to the cells of the nervous system in relation to the rest of the body. When single individuals maintain a centrality within themselves, a quality of being truly free, because the body is free only when it obeys the soul, then the virtue that characterizes the true empire can arise. The individual wills of the people harmonize with and contribute to an overall order. We have now a basic idea of what it is that lies behind any authentic authority and true unity. It is common in the modern era to find mostly negative views of the concept of empire. On the one hand, empires are criticized as oppressive, colonial, or exploitative. On the other hand, they are criticized as a type of globalist leveling or as an erasing of diverse cultures and peoples, subsuming us all into a giant deracinated soup that erases all deeper meaning of human existence. Evola is clear that what passes for an empire today does not fit the traditional definition. He says, Whenever we witness in history the triumph of a sovereignty and of a unity presiding over multiplicity in a merely material, direct, and political way, intervening everywhere, abolishing the autonomy of single groups, leveling in an absolutist fashion every right and every privilege, and altering and imposing a common will on various ethnic groups, 
then there cannot be any authentic imperial power since what we are dealing with is no longer an organism, but a mechanism. This type is best represented by the modern national and centralizing states. Wherever a monarch has descended to such a lower plane, in other words, wherever he, in losing his spiritual function, has promoted an absolutism and a political and material centralization by emancipating himself from any bond owed to sacred authority, humiliating the feudal nobility, and taking over those powers that were previously distributed among the aristocracy, such a monarch has dug his own grave, having brought upon himself ominous consequences. Absolutism is a short-lived mirage. The enforced uniformity paves the way for demagogy, the ascent of the people, or demos, to the desecrated throne. The only true empire is the empire with a spiritual center. Whenever a ruler deviates from this and begins pursuing political and material gains, the inevitable outcome is the rise of populism. In desacralizing the throne, the corrupted ruler sets the precedent that any man can occupy this seat of power, with no qualifications other than the support of the demos, of the masses. In attempting to subsume other populations through the erasure of their history and heritage in order to force a foreign political agenda on them, the state is no longer an organic unity brought together by the shared spiritual center of its people, but a mechanized leviathan bulldozing everything in its path. The traditional empire was life-affirming, but the degenerated monarchies and globalist tyrannies of the Kali Yuga promise only death and destruction in body, soul, and spirit. Evola goes on to say, Let me repeat that an empire is such only by virtue of higher values that have been attained by a given race, which first of all had to overcome itself and its naturalistic particularities. Only then will a race become the bearer of a principle that is also present in other peoples endowed with a traditional organization, although this principle is present only in a potential form. In this instance, the conquering material action presents itself as an action that shatters the diaphragms of empirical separation and elevates the various potentialities to the one and only actuality, thus producing a real unification. The principle die and become, which resembles being hit by Apollo's thunderbolt is the elementary requirement for every stock striving to achieve an imperial mission and dignity. This is exactly the opposite of the morality of the so-called sacred selfishness displayed by various nations. To remain limited by national characteristics in order to dominate on their basis other peoples or other lands is not possible other than through a temporary violence. A hand, as such, cannot pretend to dominate the other organs of the body. It can do so, however, by ceasing to be a hand and by becoming soul, or in other words, by rising up again to an immaterial function that is able to unify and to direct the multiplicity of the particular bodily functions, being superior to each one of them considered in and of themselves. This is an important prerequisite to the formation of an empire. Just as the sacred king must undergo initiation of self-overcoming to actualize his spiritual potential, so too must a race of people overcome itself. Evola says that for a race to be capable of participating in the empire, that race must go beyond identifying themselves solely by their material characteristics. The race must have their own heroic overcoming on a societal scale. The naturalistic particularities that Evola refers to includes things such as language, religion, cultural customs, or biological traits. It is not that these things have no significance, but they cannot be where a stock of people starts and finishes. There must also be a spiritual chrism to the race that enables it to participate in the transcendent, 
and find voluntary common ground with every other race who have also overcome their merely material conditioning. It is through this conquering of the material aspects of race that the barrier preventing participation in the empire is removed. Each participating people in the empire retains their unique material qualities while also being able to share in a sacred peace and justice with any other people who have also elevated themselves to a superior dignity and are living in alignment with Dharma. This point cannot be overstated. Unlike the false empires of the modern age, which seek to make every individual and race the same through an artificial leveling to the lowest common denominator, the true empire allows for and can celebrate the material diversity of peoples and cultures, understanding that the unity comes from above. In such a case, diversity is not a threat to the order, but simply an example of the one reflected into the many. Evola is very clear that an empire that is not a sacred empire is simply not an empire at all, and he likens it instead to a cancerous growth. The imperialist escapades of the Kali Yuga have all been disastrous failures, and the reason is that they lacked any authentically spiritual, metapolitical, and metanational element. While many imperialist experiments were religiously motivated, they were ultimately not spiritual connected more to dogma and ideology than to anything transcendent, and so they failed to go beyond earthly desires for increased power and riches for their own kingdoms. What can only happen then is a domination over smaller powers through violence and force, rather than through the manifestation of divine justice and peace, through exemplifying virtue and beauty, and through living in harmony with Dharma. The larger powers are then not in any way more virtuous than those they conquer, but simply have the largest capacity for violence. Once the idea of regere has become secularized and cut off from any traditional spiritual core, then it is nothing more than a temporal and centralizing idea. This is illustrated by the investiture controversy of the Middle Ages. The nobility of Europe, especially anointed kings, frequently assumed sacred duties, such as building and supporting churches and monasteries, and also by appointing bishops and abbots, who were often laymen rather than initiated clergy. The practice of simony, the sale of church offices, was widespread, and the nobility often appointed to those roles those who would be loyal to them. When investing a bishop, the king would present him with a staff symbolizing a spiritual authority and a ring symbolizing his bond and saying, receive the church. Church in this context means both the spiritualia and regalia, that is the episcopal office, but also the relevant rights and properties. In return, the newly invested bishop would swear homage to the king which would oblige the bishop to assist the king both spiritually and materially by fulfilling the requirements of servitium regis, service to the king. Up until the Gregorian reforms of the 11th century, these arrangements generally worked for the benefit of all concerned and were accepted by everyone, including popes. However, by the mid-11th century, Pope Gregory VII took issue with the nominations of bishops by kings and lords that he considered to be merely temporal rulers, and the practice became controversial. While Pope Gregory initially accepted the lay investitures at the beginning of his papacy, he eventually came into increasing conflict with King Henry IV of the German Salian dynasty, who reigned as King of Germany from 1054 and as Holy Roman Emperor from 1084. King Henry's refusal to obey Gregory's papal commands disrupted the traditional harmony between the offices. When Henry and the German and Northern Italian bishops renounced their obedience to the Pope and called on him to abdicate in 1076, Gregory excommunicated Henry and his bishops and absolved his subjects of their oaths of allegiance to Henry. An apparent reconciliation between the two in Canossa saw Henry offer penance to be received back into the church, and in so doing gave up the traditional position of the king as an authority equal to or greater than the church. 
But despite this, the tension continued and he was excommunicated again in 1080. Pope Gregory eventually banned all ecclesiastical investiture of laymen, an anti-traditional move to say the least, as it aimed at a deconsecration of both the state and of royalty by declaring that the king had no right or power to appoint priestly offices, and denying the office of the king as something sacred with a special and superior connection to God. The investiture controversy became a struggle for supremacy between sacerdotium and regnum. Evelo remarks that this is a somewhat ironic twist. In attempting to curb the power of the king over the priestly caste, it instead set a precedent for the separation of church and state that would eventually backfire on the church. Despite papal power increasing in the 12th and 13th centuries, the 14th century saw a rise in nationalism and the papal seat was forced to move from Rome to Avignon due to unfavorable political conditions, followed by the Great Schism which had disastrous effects for the Catholic Church, as rival popes divided along national lines and played into political antagonisms. The Gregorian reforms effectively stripped regal authority of its transcendent and divine character and reduced the king to only a temporal power who served at the will of the people rather than at the command of God. From this point on, the church made it clear that only the priestly caste enjoyed a sacred character and therefore that primacy belonged solely to her. The church would soon find that the populism she had stoked would turn against her authority as well. The continued involvement of the church in the political dramas of Europe undermined the spiritual authority of the clergy, and by the 16th century had led to the Reformation, an outright rebellion against the church by the masses. Once the precedent had been set that authority was derived from the common people rather than from God, such an outcome was inevitable. The anti-traditional behavior of the church is symptomatic of an emasculated spirituality lacking in a virile and active principle. Because the spiritual center had already begun to weaken and decay and was therefore losing effectiveness, a temporal political power was superimposed upon the church from the outside in order to give it a strength and efficiency again. However, it subverted the synthesis of spirituality and power that was found in regal authority by virtue of its supernatural character. The Gregorian Thomist view tries to reconcile this by conceiving of a continuity between the state and the church, and the basic view is that the state cannot act beyond a certain limit and beyond that limit the church takes over as an eminently supernatural institution. While this may seem at first to be based in tradition, Evola says, It unfortunately encounters, in the order of ideas to which it belongs, an insurmountable difficulty represented by the essential difference in the types of relationship with the divine that are proper to regality and to priesthood respectively. In order for a real continuity, rather than a hiatus, to exist between the two successive degrees of a unitary organization, scholasticism identified them with state and church, it would have been necessary for the church to embody in the supernatural order the same spirit that the imperium, strictly speaking, embodied on the material plane. This spirit is what I have called spiritual virility. The religious view typical of Christianity, however, did not allow for anything of this sort. It could be argued that the Catholic Church co-opted for itself what was left of the decaying imperial element of the Roman Empire, which served it for a time, but because the spirit of imperium was not present in the Church organically, in a virile, active, and imminent sense, it was doomed to fail. What made the Sacred King special, and what elevated him above and beyond all considerations of caste, was that he was the embodiment of the synthesis of contemplation and action. On a higher plane, contemplation and action are non-different from each other, and it is on this higher plane that the Sacred King operates from. No priest or religious institution alone can realize and manifest the supernatural forces in this way. 
Avila says, despite her hierocratic claims, the church does not embody the virile solar pole of the spirit, but the feminine lunar pole. She may lay claim to the key, but not to the scepter. Because of her role as mediatrix of the divine conceived theistically, and because of her view of spirituality as contemplative life essentially different from active life, the Church cannot represent the best integration of all particular organizations. That is to say, she cannot represent the pinnacle of a great homogeneous ordinatio ad unum capable of encompassing both the peak and the essence of the providential design that is foreshadowed, according to the above-mentioned view, in single organic and hierarchical political unities. Evola is reiterating the point from the previous chapter that the priestly caste, in this case the Catholic Church, is only a mediator of spiritual power. They do not and cannot conduct that power efficaciously because of the fundamental lack of the active element, and this is why the Church's usurpation of the regal authority was subversive and anti-traditional. The imperial element of the early Catholic Church was not a true embodiment of an authentic active principle, but merely a facade that was grafted externally onto the Church for politically expedient reasons. The Church was thus never capable of forming a true sacred empire. Because the Catholic Church could not ever constitute a true sacred empire, because she lacked the synthesis of both contemplation and action, she could never truly bring the law from above down to earth, for it is the active principle that is required for this task. Much like the mechanistic nature of modern globalism, the Catholic Church was also not an organic imperial force, but an artificially imposed structure. And while the Church did at least retain some kind of spiritual character, unlike atheistic globalism, its inability to effectively render the law from above into the material world doomed it to fail. It is that law from above that is so essential to the true traditional empire. One might object that it is somewhat unfair of Evola to pin so much of the blame of the state of the modern world onto the Church, and others might remark that the Church is a poor example of traditional principles. We must consider why Evola is using this example. As we continue to define what the world of tradition is, first of all, we must look for examples that the modern person has some reference point for. Indeed, the Catholic Church does contain some elements of the world of tradition, as all major religions do, and Evola explores this elsewhere. It is important to understand, however, that as we look to the various institutions of the modern world that contain echoes of tradition, we will also see their inherent deviations from tradition and the flaws that render them all as unsuitable vehicles for a restoration of the world of tradition. From this, we can learn both what tradition looks like and what it does not look like, and we will later be able to understand the genesis of the modern world and how and why it came to be this way. The Catholic Church is merely a product of its time, and is being used here as the most recent and glaring example of the degeneration of the relationship between regality and priesthood. In the previous chapter, Evola outlined what that relationship should look like, and in this chapter, what it should not look like. The continual worsening of the state of the relationship between regality and priesthood is an important factor in how the modern world came to be what it is. In his book, The Doctrine of Awakening, Evola illustrates the same degradation of the relationship between regality and priesthood that was running rampant throughout the world during the time of the Buddha, in which he writes, From the point of view of universal history, Buddhism arose in a period marked by a crisis running through a whole series of traditional civilizations. This crisis sometimes resolved itself positively thanks to opportune reforms and revisions, and sometimes negatively with the effect of inducing further phases of regression or spiritual decadence. This period, called by some the climacteric of civilization, falls approximately between the 8th and the 5th centuries BC. It is in this period that the doctrines of Lao Tzu and Kung Fu Tzu were taking root in China, representing a renewal of elements of the most ancient tradition on the metaphysical plane on the one hand, and on the ethical social on the other. In the same period, it is said that Zarathustra appeared, through whom a similar return took place in the Persian tradition. 
and in India the same function was performed by Buddhism, also representing a reaction and at the same time a re-elevation. On the other hand, as we have often pointed out elsewhere, it seems that in the West processes of decadence mainly prevailed. The period of which we are now talking is in fact that in which the ancient aristocratic and hieratic Hellas declined, in which the religion of Isis along with other popular and spurious forms of mysticism superseded the solar and regal Egyptian civilization. It is that in which Israelite prophetism started the most dangerous ferments of corruption and subversion in the Mediterranean world. The only positive counterpart in the West seems in fact to have been Rome, which was born in that period, and which for a certain cycle was a creation of universal importance, animated in high measure by an Olympian and heroic spirit. Indeed, we may recall from the foreword that Evola outlined four phases of this decadence, and the period he is referencing in this passage from the Doctrine of Awakening is this first phase in which the anti-traditional forces started to manifest in a tangible way in the spiritual and social life of different peoples around the world. By the time we have reached the era of the European Middle Ages in which the tension between royalty and the church had reached a fever pitch, we had already descended to the third phase. Sadly, the West has borne the brunt of the most obvious and most harmful forms of decadence, and so it is in Western institutions that Evola often finds the most damning examples of the slide into modernity. As we will see, there are many factors and many players, each chipping away at the world of tradition bit by bit like water hitting the rocky shoreline over the millennia the world of tradition has eroded into something nearly unrecognizable, so much of it lost to the crashing waves of time. What little can be recovered or preserved is invaluable and increases in worth as time goes on, are only linked to a past that now seems to exist only in a dream. But it is that dream that we must bear into the future as we revolt against the modern world. It is that dream that must be made real again. Let us march to the gates of the gods and demand the manifestation of our dream. Let us impress them with our boldness, that we even dared to dream it in the first place. For it is the last dying ember of a torch that must once again light the beacons anew. Those who remain standing with their torches held aloft will one day illuminate the dark edges of every specter and illusion and when the light of the sun penetrates all four corners of the earth, we shall once again have our king, and the forces of Gog and Magog shall be vanquished by his flaming sword. Nothing can stop them 
no fence can hold These gates are so ancient We even forgot how they glow Stolen the light of the world Will offer to see Offer the light of the world This is the moment.